Hello friends, welcome to the Christian Path. This is Reverend David. I hope you're well, and that today's message, True Peace, will give us more of an insight as to what seems to be a disappearing phenomenon, peace, what it is, how we can actually understand it, and maybe even experience it, which is a very hard thing to do in today's world. As you know, we're going to pull a lot of sources from the Holy Bible because the Bible will show us and tell us about peace and tell us how we can actually find it. The ministry here is based on the Bible. We take the experiences from people in the Bible and all the wisdom and information that the Lord put there for us and we relate these things into our own lives today so that we can grow in character be better Christians. Walk in the footsteps of Lord Jesus to stay on the Christian path that leads right to God's kingdom. Now, do you ever wonder what peace really means? What actually is peace? How can we find it? Is it one of those things that are like one of the seven wonders of the world that no matter where you look, you'll never find peace? We've all heard the word, we're familiar with what it's supposed to mean, but most of us have never personally experienced it, at least not for any length of time. We're in a physical place here, and we are looking for peace. We're looking for a lot of things, and peace is one of the most precious things that we can find. But what does the word mean? We know it's been around for thousands of years, the word peace, from ancient biblical times until right now the 21st century. In fact, do you remember back in the 60s? It was the hippie era. I was a kid at the time. I barely remember it, just things that I saw when I was watching TV or in the car with mom when we're going to the supermarket. But there were these hippies. They had the, the long hair and the beards and the sunglasses, the psychedelic clothes, carrying around peace signs, giving the peace sign with their hand, the two fingers up, and this round circle thing with a line with two other lines facing downward that was, quote, the peace sign, saying, peace, brother. But what did all that really mean? In fact, the peace sign itself I never really understood. There was a lot of controversy over that, where it was supposed to be meaning peace and no war among countries. And there was another issue where it was supposed to actually mean the broken cross. But I'm not sure exactly what was resolved with it. But when we think about peace, what is it? What does the word even mean? Well, if we look up the word peace in Webster's Dictionary, there are a few meanings there. The one is freedom from war or strife, agreement to end war, law and order, calm. Now, when most people hear the word peace, what is the first thing that comes to their minds? Freedom from war. And of course, we're thinking here on a national or an international level with that. But even in biblical times, that's what people thought of too. And that's how it's most referred to. Take a look at Matthew 10, verse 34, where Jesus says, Do not think that I came here to earth to bring peace, but I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? What level was the Lord speaking on when he said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword? Did he mean nationally or globally? 
what exactly did Lord Jesus mean when he was saying that? He was speaking on a level that went from locally all the way through to worldwide. On the local level, as Christians, the Lord's children who follow him, obey his commandments, and they serve the Lord. And in a lot of cases, there is dissension sometimes among our own friends, even our own family members. So that is a very local, individual, personalized level, isn't it? When you're a Christian and you follow the Lord, you're open to scrutiny. Let's face it, I'm sure you've gone through this too. Not to mention persecution, even avoidance. In some cases, when people hear that you're a Christian, the first thing they think is that you're some kind of a radical, holy roller nut, that you're a weirdo, that you're strange, you're a Jesus freak. And in my own experiences, I've had this happen. More than once, I've had people shun me as soon as they learned I was a Christian. Never mind a minister. What do they think? They think I'm going to get on a pedestal and I'm going to start preaching at them and, and screaming all things about fire and brimstone and all this. Why would I do that? Why would any minister do that? If you think about it, what's the point? If a person does not want to hear it, you're not going to preach because they're only going to shut down on you. It's going to fall on deaf ears. They don't want to hear it. They're going to run the other way. So why would you preach to people that don't want to hear it? You wouldn't. But you know what? People don't think that way. They see that you're a Christian or a minister. The first thing they think is, oh, he's going to preach out. He's going to try to save my soul and try to drag me to his church and all these other things. And they get away from you as fast as they possibly can. You might as well have had an encounter with a skunk and smell like one because that's how fast these people get away from you. Now, sometimes we deal with persecution and animosity in our own circles of friends, our own family, not just people that you just meet and they hear you're a Christian or a minister and they run, but it's because of the word. Because we're Christians, Jesus was talking about the sword on a local, personal level. Now, if we expand that, look at the problems and the hostility that spreads into different faiths denominations within a city, a state, and of course, all over the world. In fact, there are overseas countries that if you're there and you're not in their faith or their religion, and especially if they find out you're a Christian, they will actually kill you because you're not in their faith. You don't believe in what they believe in. Maybe they're worshiping some weird idol some, somehow with a head of a bird and the, and the uh, body of a man with claws for hands. Who knows? But if you're not worshiping their God, they will kill you. Literally. Kill you for being a Christian. That's exactly what we see to this day. Even in this country, we see dissension like that. Not radically where they will kill you, but there's a lot of persecution going on. There's a lot of contempt. A lot of dissension. Now, if we focus on the most popular definition of peace, freedom from turmoil and war, it's mentioned quite a few times in the Bible. For example, when Solomon first became king, he made an agreement with King Hiram of Tyre to send him all the materials and labor to build a house for the Lord. And in return, Solomon would pay the wages that King Hiram asked, and he would also provide an abundance of food for King Hiram's house. But at that time, Solomon had, Solomon had peace from wars, unlike his father, King David. In fact, David was the apple of God's eye. The Lord loved him. But he was pretty much a man of war, and he wanted to build a house for the Lord. And the Lord said, no, you've shed too much blood, and you've had too much war and violence, so your son after you will build my house. And that was Solomon, of course. But Solomon had peace all around. Now, what exactly did that mean? Have a look at 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 3 to 5, where Solomon says to his letter in, to King Hiram, You know how my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the wars which were fought against him on every side until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet. But now... The Lord my God has given me rest on every side. 
there is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, he shall build the house for my name. Now when Solomon is saying, The Lord my God has given me rest on every side, there is neither adversary nor evil occurrence, he was saying that he had peace all around. Nobody had any beef with Solomon. They liked him. No other country had a problem with him where they wanted to go against him and rise against him in war. That was on a governmental level. A peace on earth, goodwill toward men. What does that mean? Peace on earth and goodwill toward men. That, again, is referring to worldwide peace freedom from war and conflict. Now that's a very nice thought, isn't it? But what about peace and freedom from strife and problems like that on a personal level? We're not talking about here conflicts between countries. We're talking now about peace on an individual level. And it can't get any more personal than that. For us, personally, peace in our lives. On the international level, Strife, conflict, the lack of peace, all these things, war, it can be caused by a lot of things. One, doesn't, one, one government leader doesn't like a comment the other government leader said, or there's a pimple on his nose that the other guy didn't like. Who knows? There are all kinds of reasons. But what about for us? What about the lack of peace as an individual? Why do we have that? Why would that be? There's a lot of different problems, situations, and personal things in our lives that can rob us of our peace. Think about it. There's financial problems, health problems, problems at work, all kinds of stresses. When you look and you see what's going on with the government and the economy, all of these things do affect us on a personal level, and all of these things do rob us of our peace. But how can we get, like Solomon said, rest on all sides peace on a personal level for us individually well, let's face it here our lives are not easy they're not meant to be it's not meant to be easy living on this earth in a physical body subject to the rest of the world we know this we're constantly being tried tested tempted things go wrong for us in our lives whether it's because of bad decisions we made, or just mistakes, or things that are completely out of our control. Victims of circumstance, in other words. But either way, that's immaterial here. The results are the same. We're robbed of our peace because of it. So how do we handle it? It boils down to one word, faith. And the second word is Lord. Faith in the Lord. Putting complete faith in Lord Jesus is the only way we can even know what peace possibly could feel like. Think about it. When we put our stresses, our worries, our problems, regardless of what they are, who they're dealing with, what level they're on, into the Lord's hands, we don't have to worry about them anymore. We give them to the Lord and say, Lord, handle this for me and then we don't have to worry about it he takes the problems on now what a lot of people tend to do and i've been guilty guilty of this myself you put your problems into the lord's hands and you figure okay i have problems with this so i'm stressed out with that i'm going to put all of these things into the lord's hands and then i'm going to be free of it the burden's taken off me i can have peace but then the Lord doesn't respond or answer as quick as you would like him to. So what do you do? You snatch it back off him and take the problems right back onto your own shoulders. I've done that myself. And that is what we have to resist the temptation of doing. Remember, the Lord's thoughts are not our thoughts. He thinks on a completely different level. He's in a different dimension. Time isn't the same for him as it is for us. We don't think the way he is, the way he, we, we won't even rationalize. We can't, we are nowhere near the level of thought that the Lord is on. So how can we possibly know what he's got planned? 
And remember Jesus says, with God, all things are possible. All the things in our lives that disrupt our personal peace and cause us turmoil are the things that should be put into the Lord's hands, but then let him handle it. Trust him. Have faith in him and wait for him to handle it in the best way the Lord sees fit. And you know what? Nine times out of ten, you will be reeling when the Lord takes care of it because he will take care of a situation or a stressful situation or a problem you have in a way that you never even considered, something that never even came into your mind. But you have to put all of these things into the Lord's hands. Let him handle it. It's the only way we can ever find out what peace is, how we can experience it, and the peace from the Lord, the Holy Spirit, following the Lord, staying in constant prayer, feeling the Lord's peace. That's part of it too, a very large part of it. Did you ever go to a funeral and, of course it's ritualistic, people are walking around, they're looking at the body laying in the casket, and they offer their condolences to the family, but over here some of the conversations that some of the people are having, they'll say, wow, doesn't he look great? He looks so peaceful. Well, come on. How can a person look peaceful? He's dead! <laughs> well, I'll tell you how. It's, is it, wh wh why would the person look peaceful when they're laying in the casket there? When, when they were alive, they didn't have any peace at all. They were constantly stressed out. They were always angry, but now that they're dead, they look peaceful. Is it the magic wizardry of the cosmetic ability of the funeral director? He is so good with makeup that he can make this person look actually peaceful? No, not at all. The funeral director can only do so much. He can do makeup or wigs or clothing. He can maybe eliminate a few wrinkles from the person's face, but his ability can only do so much. He can't put an actual feeling an expression of peace on the deceased person's face. So why is it there? Think about it. That person is not in his body anymore. He's in the spirit realm. His entire being at that point is in the hands of the Lord. So even in death, we see that peace comes from the Lord. But the good news here is we don't have to wait until we're dead to have peace. We want it now while we're still alive. But we can have peace from the same source. Our Father in Heaven and our loving Savior and brother, Lord Jesus. Now, the deceased person can't tell you anything one way or the other. But take a lesson from the look he has on his face. From how peaceful that deceased person looked laying in that casket. We're still among the living. But we can have peace now, just like that person who passed away has it now. Same source through the Lord. And look at the big picture. This life is just physical. The world is temporary, so are all the things that can rob us of our peace. Think about it. If you're having all kinds of problems at work, 50 years from now, you're not going to be working at that job. Or if you're having problems with health or money, anything that causes you stress or robs you of your peace, 100 years from now, for example, it's not going to exist, even for me. Now, unless I live to be 155 years old, which I don't think so in physical form, any problems or stresses that would rob me of my peace will not even be an issue 100 years from now. I won't care, and neither will you, because none of us are going to be alive 100 years from now in physical form. So why let these things in this physical life get to us, rob us of our peace? And where else do you think it's coming from? Where do you think anything negative, including robbing us of our peace, our happiness, anything, would come from? The enemy. We all tend to forget, and conveniently sometimes, because it's not pleasant to think about, but we forget we do have a spiritual enemy who is constantly trying to get at us, destroy us, kill us, make sure we don't get into the Lord's kingdom because he hates us. And you know who we're talking about here? 
Satan himself, and he's got legions of demons helping him to do this. They zero in. They hate humanity, especially if you're a Christian. They'll do anything in their power to rob you of anything they possibly can, including your peace. They'll try to pull you away from the Lord. They'll try to make you feel worthless. They'll make you feel stupid. They'll say you're not worth anything. You're garbage. Why do you think they would do that? Because they want to destroy our self-esteem. They want to destroy our ego if we have any. They want to make us feel like we're complete useless wastes. Like we're not worth anything. And hey, we know differently. We know we are the Lord's children and we are worth a lot. The Lord loves us so incredibly and unconditionally that we couldn't even comprehend how much he loves us. So does that make us worthless? Are we useless? No. But the enemy would have us believe that. He'll try to rob you of your faith, rob you of your peace, rob you of anything that you have that the Lord gives you. Try to make you do unwise things despite the wisdom the Lord has given you. He'll try to slowly whittle away at the Holy Spirit within you to take it from you, to pull you back into the world so you'll be one of his, so that you will meet the same demise he will one day, and we know his demise is not going to be a good one. But we have to keep this in mind. He will rob us of a lot of things, including our peace. That's why our main focal point at all times has to be on the Lord. Lord Jesus is the only Savior. He is the way we get into the kingdom. He is our only way to the Father. He told us that. Now, we know that peace can be global or personal. That's obvious. We can't control global peace. Let's face it. Can we do anything to make one country not rise up against the other as individuals? Well, of course not. If one country wants to go to war with another, we can't do a thing about that. We have no control. But we do have control over our personal peace. Look at the big picture. This life and all the problems that we have in our lives will rob us of our peace. Satan is out, goes out of his way to do that also. Why should we let him do that? Our Lord and Savior, Lord Jesus, can give us peace, love, the faith, the strength we need to stay on the Christian path, we don't have to worry about the enemy. Although he is going to be constantly at us, trying to get us to sin, trying to get us to do what we're not supposed to, break the commandments, turn away from the Lord. He is going to do everything he can to rob us of everything good that the Lord gives us, including our peace. Why should we let him do that? We can't. And how do we make sure he doesn't? We have to stay in constant touch with the Lord. Remember, we're only passing through here. We're living a human life so that we can grow and develop in character, in spirit, so we can be more like the Lord, to serve and please and love him, to shine a light to others. That's why we're here. We have a mission. We have a reason to be here. We are children of the Lord. But that doesn't mean that we can't have peace while we're here. It doesn't mean that we have to be unhappy or miserable or in constant turmoil. The Lord doesn't want that for us. He loves us. Lord Jesus himself came here to show us firsthand as a physical human how to handle different problems, how to handle different stresses. Now, do you think that Lord Jesus didn't have stress on him when he was here? Of course he did. He had the Pharisees, Sadducees, lawyers. He had these people constantly at him, trying to trip him up, trying to actually get him involved in a conspiracy that would lead to his physical demise, and it worked. He knew about that. That's why he came. That was one of the reasons he arrived here, not just to show us how to live, how to walk in his footsteps, leave footsteps for us to walk in, but also to die for our sins. But do you think that all during the time the Lord was here, he didn't have these stresses on him? Of course he did. How did he handle it? He prayed directly to the Father. We have Lord Jesus as our intercessor. We pray directly to Lord Jesus, just like he prayed to the Father. That's how Lord Jesus found his peace while he was here, while he was human. Well, 
Look at his example. We're human, so we do the same thing. We pray to the Lord. We stay in constant touch with Lord Jesus. He is what gives us our peace. We put all our problems onto him. We say, Lord, handle these so we don't have to worry about them anymore. Let him take care of it. Stay in constant touch with the Lord. He will give us the strength, the Holy Spirit, so we can maintain our peace. Why should we let anyone rob us of the peace that we're supposed to have while we're still here, while we're human? Be it other people, situations, problems, or Satan himself or his demons, all of these factors are trying to rob us of our peace. So do you see here, being human, being Christian, what we're up against? That's why in most of my messages, if not all of them, I say that once you are baptized, you repent, you accept the Lord as your Savior, and you're on the Christian path, don't think your life is going to become a bowl of cherries and it's going to be easy, because it isn't. It's just the opposite. Then you have a lot of factors against you, actually plotting against you, that you wouldn't have if you were of the world. Because if you're of the world, you're not going to have Satan coming after you, trying to deter you, or attack your morals, get you to sin. You're not going to have other people ridiculing you, persecuting you. You're not going to have all of these other things against you as a physical person. But when you're a Christian, you do. That's why you can't do it yourself. So when you repent, and you're baptized, and you accept the Lord as your Savior, you're walking then in the Lord's footsteps, you're on the Christian path, it's not going to be an easy road. I can tell you from her first-hand experience, it is not an easy journey to be on. All the factors that we just discussed are against you. They're trying to get at you. They're your adversaries. But you know what? Don't think you're alone. You're not. Once you're on the Christian path, And when I say being baptized, I'm not talking about being baptized into any specific faith or religion or denomination. Just baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. Then you're on the Christian path and life becomes totally different and it will not be easy. But you're not alone. Do you think the Lord would put you on that path? Call you on that kind of a difficult road and then just say, okay, well, good luck to you. Hope you do all right. Let me know how you make out. No, he would not do that. We have the Lord with us, always. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Bible. We have each other, brethren. We are not alone on this path. And if you need me for anything, don't hesitate to contact me. All my information is right on my website. It's www.mychristianpath.net. My Christian Path. So if you need me, don't hesitate to call me. So keep your Bible glued to your side. Make sure you read scriptures every day. Keep your faith strong. And if you need me, contact me. We are on the Christian path. It's not an easy road to be on, but there is no reason at all why being on this path would have to rob us of our personal peace. The Lord is there. We have to stay in constant touch with him. Keep your prayer lines open. Don't let anyone rob you of your peace. The Lord gives us that. It's a gift. We are going to maintain it. Until next time, goodbye, friends.